Hi everyone, uh, this is Doug. Uh, this will be this will be an episode on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Prove Paul was rebuffed and rejected by twelve and James. This is episode one. This is something that uh, is really astounding that uh, Eisenman has written all these books to try to bring a truth to the Christian community, and neither Catholics nor Protestants want to know anything about it. Whoa, whoa, whoa that's amazing. You'll see it. It's all about a group that was the apostle, apostles, the twelve and James are in there in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's not really even possible to dispute it, as we'll see. Okay, now what we'll see when we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls is there is a group called Ebion, and they're led by the Zadik. They've been, uh, they've had the Messiah come. He's been killed by the priests of Jerusalem. Uh, they're having trouble with a uh, person who's uh, called the Spouter of Lies, the enemy who is insisting that salvation is by faith alone and the pushback by the Zadik, meaning the just one, the righteous one, he is trying to, is trying to say, hey, wait a minute, no, look at this passage, look at that passage, look at Habakkuk 2, verse 4. The the opponent, uh, the enemy, keeps saying Habakkuk 2, four, verse 4, supports his idea that you're saved by faith alone. So this is, uh, and there's two books that the Zadik, the just one, the righteous one, writes to uh, called justification by works to rebuff the argument that had been supplied by the enemy, the spouter of lies about how Habakkuk 2 verse 4 means faith when yeah, you'll see, you know, in, in Hebrew, it doesn't mean faith by the way. Emina means steadfastness, but in Greek, it was translated in the corrupt translation of the Septuagint of 247 BC as uh, being, what do you know? Faith. All right, so let's get begin, and uh, I think you'll find this a very fascinating episode. Okay, first we have to learn the name of our early church and who they were, and so uh, let's look at some of the non-biased uh, historical works. The earliest Christians were commonly called Ebionites, meaning the poor. In G. Olharns, the article Ebionites, a religious encyclopedia or dictionary of biblical, historical, doctrinal, and practical theology, third edition, he writes, this is in the 1880s, by the way, uh, and I'll show you 1891. There it is, uh, there below. And he says the Ebionites, this designation was at first like Nazarenes, a common name for all Christians as Epiphanes testifies it is derived from the Hebrew Ebion poor and was not given as Oregon supposes for their low view of Christ at page 684. So what this, uh, Alharn is saying is the early church was known as the Ebion and that was their name. Like you would have a lighthouse church. And that's how they would connect to each other uh, or, or identify one another. They didn't set, call themselves Christians. They didn't call themselves anything else uh, except maybe N Nazarenes at the time. And um, let's take a look here. So here's the encyclopedia. I just want to show you when you click that link, this is what will come up and shows 1891. This is the title page. Here's the article. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. So you can see here it says, Ebonites, this designation was at first like Nazarenes, a common name for all Christians as Epiphanius testifies in the 4.3 AD. It is derived from the Hebrew word poor. It was not given as organ supposes in reference to their low views of Christ, but to their own poverty. This is a poverty. Now I want to read a little more. This poverty, especially characteristic of the Christians of Jerusalem, evoked from the pagan and Jewish world the contemptuous appellation of the poor. So uh, people who didn't like the apostles, that right? Jesus says they're going to be persecuted. They would refer to them as the poor and and try to make it sound derogatory. Um, Min Minutus, Minutius Felix says, quote, they, we, that we are called the poor is not our disgrace, but our glory. And that's a book he wrote called Octavi uh, 36. Subsequently, its application was limited to a Jewish, to Jewish Christians, quote, the Jews who accept Christ are called Ebionites, writes Oregon. Okay, so that's a category. All Jews who accepted Christ were called Ab Ebion. So that was the church they were affiliated with the original apostolic church. Then when a portion of the Jewish church became separate and heretical, the designation was used exclusively of it. No, when the church became heretical and denying certain basic truths is that Jesus was born of a Davidic line and the corrupt, corrupted text that the Gentiles started using had replaced that with a story made up by a translator and the Ebionites went furious. And that's in the around 200, I'll, I'll leave it. It's about 200 that that happened. And, you, and I'm going to show you, you'll actually see it's indirectly proven by something Arrhenius says. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, 
Uh, then what the Ebionites were known for is uh, clinging. Uh, the Ebionites as stubbornly clinging to the law, right? So they're not going to become apostates. So yes, you stubbornly cling to the law because you don't want to go to hell. And that's what happens to people who throw out the law of Moses. The Gentiles are never informed of this because they never are told to go read Deuteronomy 13, but I digress. And all the gospels except Matthew. Um, so, so oh, it says they reject all the gospels except Matthew, and that's false. We'll see from Arrhenius, they also respected and read and recommended Luke's gospel, which is a actually proven now to have been a translation of the original Hebrew gospel of Matthew, uh, as uh, a professor recently established. Uh, he, Christ's birth from the virgin, they regarded him as a mere man. Uh, oh, excuse me, denying Christ's birth from the virgin, they regarded him as a mere man. No, they regarded him as an heir of David. Therefore, you can't have a virgin birth and still have Christ be the Messiah. So they knew the Gentiles had gone into a crazy direction of denying the very, <laughs> they claim they're following Jesus as the Christ while they, de they deny he could be the Christ by having made up this story. They literally hired Symmachus, an expert from Hebrew, to show that they had falsely translated the word in Isaiah uh, in 7.14 about a, a prophecy of a, a, of a young woman who will have a child. And they were trying to, uh, Matthew was trying to apply that to Jesus in a, sen in a sense. But anyway, it didn't mean, young, it didn't mean virgin. And that's how it was translated into Greek. Parthenos inside the Greek translation of the <laughs> Matthew that it was being circulated now among the Gentiles. And that led to this whole idea. Hey, let's just create a story that will fit that he had a virgin birth, which uh, destroyed Christianity. And we didn't even know it as Gentiles because we don't know that in first Samuel, uh, first Samuel seven, Jesus can't be Christ unless he's of a Davidic line. And he has to have a father who's from the line of David. And, and they got rid of this and they got rid of this. I'm going to show you can prove it. It was right around 200. You'll see why. Because, uh, well, I'll tell you right now, Arrhenius only criticizes the Ebionites for, it doesn't even criticize, he, he describes them, but never mentions they believe in, uh, they reject the virgin birth because Arrhenius writing in the late 100s himself has never heard of virgin birth. So the fact, it's not even a controversy yet. So it's going to be post Arrhenius writing this summary of the Ebionite views, but we'll, we'll see that in a second. Uh, now, I like this uh, article because Ulhorn also mentioned something. The Ebonites were Kilius, which means they believed in the millennial reign of Christ's coming, which is what? The same thing as the book of Revelation says. When, we, when he comes back, we're going to have a thousand years reign. That's called millennium. And therefore, we're in the pre-millennium or Kilius stage. Then the, in Epiphanes' day in 43 AD, they dwelt principally in the regions along the Dead Sea, but also in Rome and Cyprus. Now, that doesn't rule out that they lived at the Dead Sea earlier than that. And I just want to throw out the possibility that even though we'll see the scholarly scholars all say what happened, or it's Gold has now established successfully, and the Jewish antiquities have confirmed that what really happened and why the Dead Sea Scrolls are where they are is during the siege of Jerusalem, the temple was had a temple library that was then uh, completely uh, pa back, packaged up and brought down in Herod's tunnel that goes out from underneath Jerusalem, the city itself. And the uh, Romans presumably didn't know about this and they were literally escaping with the library books and could get to a certain point far enough away the Romans wouldn't see them and they could then secrete and walk all the way down to the Dead Sea and put all these uh, treasures into a dry, dry cave and they could come back and get it. But this is during the siege of Jerusalem. This is all being done. And unfortunately, those people, most of them died there. And that's why they were never recovered again. And they all were perished. There are million, million people were in that uh, temple ground city. Uh, and the Romans just, just de demolished them and killed them a million. At that time, that's in a huge in amount of people. So I think it's possible that the, my point was this, is the Ebionites were later at the Dead Sea could they have actually been the ones early on who put some, if if they didn't if their works were not being kept as part of just keeping track the jewish people would probably uh, there were a lot of uh, sympathizers with james for example so they might have wanted his works anyway in there and you'll see there's still works called the uh, ju justification by works two copy two two uh, editions or two volumes written by the zadik 
Okay. In conflict against the spatter of lies, who believes Habakkuk 2 verse 4 means you're saved by faith alone. So, I mean, it's just so, it's uncanny if you think this just is a coincidence. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the possibility I just want to suggest is they could have literally known themselves where the temple library had been put and they themselves put their own works inside of there. That could be another reason it got there. But on the other hand, it just also makes logical sense that the priests and the scholars of Judaism would have taken these works that they were able to see from the uh, the the group called the Ebion and put them in their own library just to safeguard them and so they could study them and understand what they are teaching. Okay, over 100 years later, in about 180 AD, Arrhenius, a bishop from Gaul, now known as France, clearly describes those who persisted in the designation as Ebonites, rejected Paul, and followed the law, relying upon Matthew's gospel. In, and by the way, the work is not was not originally called against the heresies. It was just called heresies. And in Greek, the word her heresies or heresias has no connotation of negativity at all. It simply means a school of thought or an opinion or opinions. So uh, when you add the word against, you make, it makes you think that all heresy, all opinions are false, right? <laughs> but that's a, a false designation and that wasn't its original pur purpose. And uh, I'll, I'll prove that to you in a little bit, but that's not material exactly at this time. Anyway, let's listen to what he said. Those who are called Ebionites agree that the world, oh, but just notice this, nothing here is negative in and of itself. If I told you the title is, the word is schools of thought, read this with that in mind. Is he just simply saying, honestly, and this is all he says about the Ebionites, is he just telling you a school of thought? amongst Christianity? Or is he saying, trying to say something nasty or imply something negative? Those who are called Ebionites agree that the world was made by God, but their opinions with respect to the Lord are similar to those of Serenthus and Carpo Carbocrates. They use the gospel according to Matthew only and repudiate the apostle Paul, maintaining that he was an apostate from the law. As to the prophetical writings, they endeavor to expound them in a somewhat singular manner. They practice circumcision, persevere in the observance of those customs which are enjoined by the law, and are so Judaic in their style of life that they even adore Jerusalem as if it were the house of God. And I think what that means, by the way, is they prayed, they were known to pray uh, in, in the direction of the temple of Jerusalem from wherever they were praying. All right. Now, Arrhenius in uh, book three, chapter 15, or at least it's described to him, uh, of that work called Heresias, Schools of Thought. It, right, Arrhenius, it says, writes the Ebionites, quote, do not recognize Paul as an apostle, end of quote there, but, quote, make use of the gospel we have come to know through Luke, but reject the book of Acts. So yes, they did accept the book of Luke as well as the gospel of Matthew. All right, next we'll cover the uh, fortuitous discovery of Ebionite writings. Uh, did the world recently discover treasure trove of the writings of the Ebionites from which we can objectively measure their orthodoxy? A good argument has been recently made by Professor Eisenman and James, the brother of Jesus, that we have recovered some of the Ebionite writings among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this is a, actually, a, these are the words I wrote in 2005. That's almost 25 years ago. We'll be in two more years. Uh, and things really haven't changed. And, and the question is, is why are Protestant and uh, Catholic uh, organizations not saying, hey, wow, we found something that we could really correct some of our wrong doctrine, our wrong way of thinking. If we went back to l learning the Ebionites, our, our original founding uh, church leaders. And uh, next we continue. Many of the sectarian works of the Dead Sea are written by a group whom who in Hebrew called themselves Ebionim or Ebion, the poor. They even described themselves as, quote, the congregation of the poor. Now keep paying attention to right here. This is key. You'll see who these people are. The poor of the Dead Sea Scrolls claim to be followers of the, the way, part of the, quote, new covenant, who found the, quote, Messiah, and the, quote, who is called the, quote, prince of the congregation, and he's also called the, quote, teacher of righteousness. He is gone, killed at the urging of the priests of Jerusalem. 
after the departure of the Messiah, who will return. That's an interesting thing that they expect him to return to earth. After death, the temporal leader who led the poor was called the just one, or actually he was called separately just Zadik, which means righteous one or just one. Uh, and this is footnote four, again, to the chapter five of my book, Jesus' Words Only, from 2005. And it says in footnote four, the Dead Sea Scrolls identify the community as the poor of Psalm 37, where, quote, the congregation of the poor shall possess the whole world as an inheritance. Psalm 37, this is a citation, Psalm 37 in Dead Sea Scrolls Pesher, that means commentary, three colon 10. Their self-identification is evident repeatedly in the Habakkuk Pesher. The wicked priest who killed the Zadik will be, quote, paid back in full for his wickedness against the poor Hebrew Ebionim. And that's Norman Gold, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1995 and 85. And uh, the verbatim original quote in the Dead Sea Scrolls is, quote, the Lord will render destructive judgment on that wicked priest just as he plotted to destroy the poor. 1 QP, HAB, 12.2. Furthermore, their leader, the Zadik, is in a struggle against the, quote, spatter of lies, end of quote, who seeks to seduce the new covenant community from following the law of Moses. The poor, the Ebion, reject the idea that Habakkuk 2, verse 4, means justification is by faith and insists its meaning is, quote, justification by faithfulness. The Dead Sea Scrolls Ebion have two writings, both called justification by works, that's the name, twice, which reaffirm the rejection of the position position of the spouter of lies. When we compare the Ebion of the Dead Sea Scroll to what Arrhenius describes as the Ebionites, the similarities are striking. The Christian sect of Ebionites seem to match the writings of the poor, the Ebionim, Ebion, whose writings were found in the, at the Dead Sea site of, of Qumran. These Dead Sea Scrolls reflect the ideas and thoughts that are unmistakably Christian. Footnote 5, we'll take a look at that in a second. Here's footnote five. For example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is an uncanny debate over justification by works versus faith, centering upon a discordant view of Habakkuk 2, verse 4. The Dead Sea Scroll writings advocate justification by works. The, their, quote, enemy, end of quote, is one of, who spouses that the law is no longer to be followed. Quote, a similar, voc this is uh, Alan Siegel, Paul the Convert, New York, Yale University, 1990, at 174, and he quotes, a similar vocabulary of justification was used by the DSS, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Paul's invective in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, has close affinities with the DSS polemic. So this is that he would be the one under attack is what he's talking about. Segal goes on to explain, quote, Paul reads Habakkuk as contradicting the notion that Torah justifies in the DSS. The same verse was used to prove that, the, that those who observe the Torah will be saved it, at page 180. The Dead Sea Scrolls thus mirror uncannily the Paul versus James debate. Unfortunately, this cannot be... Uh, so, uh, how do we know the date these were written? Because people say, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls are mostly from 200 BC. But the answer is, we know that there's lots of documents that are later. And the pennies and coins that were left in the cave show that it was occupied in the late 60s, just before the temple destruction. And people's coins had dropped out of their pockets, and we can date the coins from the date on the coin <laughs> that had to be at least from the date on the coin or later. Okay. Professor Eisenman finds significant proof the Dead Sea Scrolls, Dead Sea Ebionim is a Christian group. For example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the temporal ruler of the Ebionim who succeeds the killed Messiah who will return is called Zadik. Numerous ancient sources outside the DSS identify James the Just, that's the brother of Jesus, as the Zadik. Translated, this means just one. Jerome by the 400s will call him James the Just. In Christian writings of that era, the name of James was rarely used. He was merely called the Zadik or Just One. So they didn't. nobody was even using his name. Just as it appears in Dead Sea Scrolls, we independently know James was being referred to similarly by the same term, Zadik, as we'll see here in a second. Um, here is the quote. James' title was, uh, this is a support from Eisenman, brother of Jesus, at page 375, quote, James' title was the just or the just one, which Epiphanius tells us was so identified with this person as to replace his very name itself. So I'm going to tell you, you if you want to learn more about this, Hecasippus said the same thing. He was known by his name, Hecus the Zadik, and that's, again, exactly replicating that way in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, that, so that I'll leave that for you others to check. Now... Uh,
Okay, and then Eisenman, in his book, James, the Brother of Jesus, uh, focuses on, on the Clementine homilies. And uh, this work has always been recognized as a work of the Ebonites. The question is, how old was it? Did it go all the way back to the first century, meaning the original church? Well, let's read it. From the Criticism and Documents, this is page, page 377 of James, the Brother of Jesus. From this criticism documents like the Pseudo-Clementines, that's another reference to the Clementine homilies. Uh, they were all retranslated by Rufinus in the 380s from Greek into uh, Latin. And then all the Greek copies and all the original copies were destroyed. That's the crime of Rufinus uh, that he committed on many, many other documents. But that means he's made modifications. You just have to figure out which ones he made, and then you can find or extract the original text. Anyway, uh, the Pseudo-Clementines or the Clementine homilies, we can ascertain that not only did they revere James, but that they considered Jesus a mere man, naturally generated by Joseph and Mary. Well, of course, they believed in the Davidic Messiahship of Jesus. It had to be fulfilled according to the book of Samuel by having Jesus be of the flesh of David. That's the prophecy of a Messiah there. Uh, so uh, it's just the t us gem... The we are dumb Gentiles. We don't know how crucial that is and that uh, we should be helping to ferret out the fraud that is approximately around the 200, uh, around the year 200 is when the virgin birth was first created. And uh, we'll digress a la later on that at another time. Okay, so he's naturally generated by Joseph and Mary, so say the Ebion, and that they insisted on being circumcised because they're Jews and because Jesus was... They followed the Torah of Moses in a fairly assiduous manner and considered Paul to be a heretic and apostate from the law and the enemy incarnate. And he cites uh, 47, and uh, it's I think he meant to say 48, because if you go to the Clementine homilies, 2.15-17, 2 42-53, uh, I went through that uh, carefully, and here they all are. Let me see. Clementine homily 2, colon 15, uh, referring to Paul, likely. Again, it's often hidden by Rufinus. Uh, this enemy was a fellow worker of error and deceit. Uh, then uh, I'll just skip that one. That's a little obscure. Okay. Anyway, so that's that's what he referred to, and that's what the early church, the Ebion, is is ascribed to them that they wrote the Clementine homilies, and that is depicting Paul as an enemy. If Professor Eisenman is correct, this means the Ebonites and Eusebius' writings are the Jerusalem church under James. What Professor Eisenman then notes to corroborate this idea is that Paul refers twice to the sending money to the poor Jerusalem. Eisenman says that this just as easily could be the poor with a capital P, and this is in Romans 15, verse 26, and Galatians 2, verses 9 to 10. If we translate back Paul's words into Hebrew, he was saying the Ebion of Jerusalem was the name of the church under James. They were the congregation of the poor, just like we might call the church the Lighthouse Church. We do not see Paul's intent due to the case size in the standard text, which changes the capital P poor into the small letter P poor. Here is what uh, Eisenman said at page 156 of his book, James, the Brother of Jesus, about this issue of the poor. And did Paul even refer to the Jerusalem church as the poor? It says here, Paul states in Galatians 2, verse 10, the only condition that the pillars uh, of the church, James, Cephas, and John, that's Peter, James, Peter, and John, put on his activities was, quote, that we should remember the poor, which was also the very thing I was most diligent in wishing to do. So that didn't mean remember the economically poor, but the name of the church back in Jerusalem. Not only should one note the emphasis on doing, always an important em emphasis in these discussions, but the allusion to the poor at this juncture is another very important usage intricately related to James' Jerusalem community. Though it is possible to take it simply in its adjectival sense of being poor and nothing more, there can be little doubt that the poor was the name for James' community in Jerusalem or that community descended from it in the East in the next two, three centuries, the Ebionites. Now, uh, Professor Eisenman is very clear that the Essenes are not at the Dead Sea Scrolls. The name or word Essene never appears, just so you know, in any of the Dead Sea Scrolls documents. Yet the Catholic Church, all their scholars made us believe it was all an Essene community, and it simply had nothing to do with them in the end. Uh, what heightens the probability Professor Eisenman is correct is recent archaeology. 
the initial hypothesis what the dead was that the Dead Sea Scrolls were exclusively the writings of an Essene sect from the 200 BC era. This idea recently crumbled in 2004. This is me writing in 2005. Golb's contrary hypothesis that the Dead Sea Scrolls came from the Temple of Jerusalem between 65 and 70 AD has now been strongly confirmed by extensive archaeological digs under the auspices of Israeli universities. These digs prove there was no community site of monks at Qumran. Qumran. It was a clay plate factory, my friends. The initial inference of a large community of monks was from the presence of a large number of plates, misinterpreted, which was misinterpreted uh, as evidence of a monk community with uh, many plates for the purpose of having community dinners and eating and all that. And that's just a bunch of uh, malarkey. It turned out it was a clay plate plate factory. Let's continue. Uh, Second, we can now infer the scrolls were hidden in the mountains to protect the scrolls and not because a large community had been involved in copying activity. In fact, archaeology now proves that there was no copy center or scriptorum. As originally claimed, none of the metal clips copies used to guide copying were found at Qumran. A few ordinary pens and numerous coins were found, yet no metal clips of copies, not even a fragment of one. We continue. Golb's argument has now essentially been vindicated. Golb made a scholarly case that DSS, the DSS are writings that were taken from the temple at Jerusalem during the years of the Roman siege that finally prevailed in 70 AD. Hiding them in these caves preserved them from the torches, which in the end destroyed the temple in 70 AD after a long siege. This is footnote nine to back that up. And so let's listen to this. Norman Golb, the citation for that proof is Norman Golb, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, New York, Scribner's 1995, at pages 11, 12, 30, 36. See also the archaeological report of 2004 by Megan and Peleg that destroyed many myths about Qumran, proving it was not an Essene settlement. See AP News, August 8, 2004, San Francisco Chronicle 9, September 6, 2004, Heretz, Israel, July 30, 2004. Finally, this story is now being carried in mainstream publications. I'm writing it in 2005. See Carmichael, quote, Archaeology, Questions in Qumran, Newsweek, September 6, 2005, available at the Newsweek site. Newsweek mentions that, quote, Megan and Peleg set off what can only be called an academic revolution, end of quote, which now corroborates, quote, Norman Golb, who first argued what Megan and Peleg now confirm. See also, quote, the Dead Sea Scrolls, title of the uh, uh, work is the Dead Sea Scrolls, virtualreligion.net, and so on and so forth. And it says there, after 10 years of excavation, Megan and Peleg conclude that the settlement of quote, Qumran could not have been a monastery, but rather was a pottery factory, which was vacated by its few inhabitants during the Jewish-Roman War. Thus, recent archaeological discoveries of Qumran established that many of the documents can be potentially prepared in the Christian era. We no longer are forced to disregard the Christian character of certain writings merely because of the Essene hypotheses, which strangle direct... um, Dead Sea Scrolls studies until now. Among the newer writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find some in Hebrew written written by a group calling itself the poor, the Ebion. This translates very well, or transliterates very well as the Ebionites. Here's footnote 10 on that. Scholars other than Eisenman are beginning to realize the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written by the Ebion, are potentially related to the group known as the Ebionites in Eusebius' writings. See, for example, University of Pennsylvania DSS Conference of October 19, 2004, which mentions the Pesharim document from Cave 1, stating, quote, Column 12 raises the question as to whether the DSS community referred to itself as the poor. This could be important for early Christian studies since the Ebionites, Hebrew for poor, was a name used by Jewish Christians later on. So we've leave, we've come to the last slide, and I'm going to give you a little teaser for the next episode. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls depict the trial of Paul? What is highly intriguing is a further theory of Professor Eisenman about Paul. He claims the poor's writings in the DSS speak of a trial of Paul. He says James is depicted as Paul's key antagonist in a heated confrontation where Paul spoke vigorously against James. Paul's effort was viewed as an attempt to split the group. Eisenman bases this on two DSS writings. The first is the Habakkuk Pesher, a commentary on Habakkuk 2 verse 4, a favorite verse of Paul. The DSS author interprets the verse, however, to require faithfulness for salvation. The Pesher then rejects the idea that justification is without adding works to faith. Okay, so that's the end of episode one. I hope you can see that the Ebion are our original apostolic church. 
And please look forward to the next episode where we will, where we will demonstrate that Paul was put on trial by this, uh, the Abion, the Christian uh, apostles, the uh, Zadik, James the Just, and we'll uh, see where we actually cross intersects with the work by Ambrose about the a decision, a trial of Paul that he refers to where Paul was found a false apostle. And it's, he writes that in the 350s, but obviously there was some record at that time of this trial because he says it's so matter-of-factly, not like it was a controversial item. All right, God bless everyone. I hope that helps. Ciao, bye.